Hello and welcome to this tutorial. We're going to show you how to configure OSPF. Now in this tutorial we're only going to cover the required configurations in order to get OSPF up and running on a router. There are many optional configurations with OSPF however and we're going to address those individually in dedicated tutorials. Okay, so we'll cover the configurations and then we'll also introduce a few verification commands we can use in order to confirm our configurations and also the status of OSPF. So we'll start off by actually creating the OSPF process on the router. We'll enable OSPF on the interfaces that we want it to run on. And then we'll verify the status and then we'll take a look at the OSPF route table. Before we start with the configurations, let's take a look at our scenario. In the lab, we have two routers connected via a serial connection, and that serial connection is going to use the 172.16.1.0 subnet. It's a slash 30. So we'll be making all of our changes on router A. Router B has already been configured. So if we do this properly, then OSPF should come up. Okay, I'm going to start off by jumping ahead and looking at one of the verification commands, show IP OSPF. And you'll see after entering it, we don't get any output. And that's because OSPF is not enabled on this router yet. After our configurations, we'll revisit this and take a look at all the information we, we do learn when it is actually enabled. So to begin, we have to enable OSPF and we do that with the router OSPF command. When we issue this command, it's going to enable OSPF on the router, and it creates an instance of OSPF. Now, we can have multiple instances running of OSPF on a single router. We're not just limited to one. That's why when we enable OSPF and we create this instance, we have to give it a unique identifier. And you'll see here, this is referred to as the process ID. And you can choose a number between 1 and 65, 535. Now, I think running a router with 65,535 instances of OSPF, depending on the sizes of the link state database, uh, it, it'll probably eat up all the resources. But the, the takeaway point here is that you can have multiple uh, OSPF instances running at the same time. Now, this number that you choose is only locally significant to the router. So any other neighbors on the network, they don't care which router process ID you use on any other router. This is purely an administrative number. I'm going to go ahead and choose the number one and after we issue this command we're put into OSPF configuration mode. Now the next thing we need to do is to tell the router which interfaces are going to participate in OSPF. And the command to do that is the network command. Now the first parameter is a network number and so our network on our serial interface is 172.16.1.0 and after that we have to enter a wildcard mask. So this is just like a access list if you remember those tutorials. If we have a slash 30 that means our last quad here is going to be dot 3. So what we're telling the router here is any interface with an IP address configured on it that falls within this range, go ahead and enable OSPF on it. So this can be a very useful command in that you can enable OSPF on a broad range of IP uh, interfaces at the same time. For instance, if we put 255 in the last quad, then we've now enabled OSPF on any interface in that slash C. However, that can also be a bad thing because what if there are interfaces within that subnet that we don't want OSPF enabled on? So this can be a little bit tricky, so be careful with this. A best practice states when you're configuring OSPF is to actually list the interface IP address and then the wildcard mass is going to be all zeros. So here we're telling the router only enable OSPF on the interface with the IP address 172 one six one dot one. There's just less room for making mistakes this way. Now after this bit we have to assign this interface to an area and you'll see here the parameters are just the area IDs. We will choose area zero 
And those are the two required commands in order to get OSPF running on your router. At this point, we're actually done with the configuration portion. So let's go ahead and take a look at the show IP OSPF command again. And you'll see now we get a lot of output. What I want to bring your attention to is this first line, routing process OSPF1. That one was the process ID that we chose. And then right after that, you can see the OSPF router ID, 192.168.255.253. So this command is not only useful for determining if OSPF is enabled on the router, but also what process IDs are running, if there's one or multiple ones, and then which router ID is used in each process. The next command is show IP OSPF neighbor. This will list all of the neighbors that we have made since enabling OSPF. And you can see here we have one neighbor. So we learned the neighbor ID 192.168.255.254. You can see the state of the neighbor. We are full neighbors, so we are fully adjacent with that neighbor. And then you can see some interface information. First, by address, that's the IP address of the neighbor, the actual interface of the neighbor. And then it lists our interface, serial 000. That last zero wraps around to the next line. So we can find out how, uh, how do we reach this neighbor, on what interface is this neighbor connected. So at this point, we're pretty confident that OSPF is up and running on this router, and we've created one neighbor so far. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the route table. Let's begin with the show IP route command. And you can see here on the far left side, anything that has an O in front of it means OSPF. Now we have two entries here, so we're learning two routes from our neighbor. The first one is the 192.168.2.0. It's a single IP, it's a slash 32. And then you can see we have also learned 192.168.3.0. Now let's take a look at the key for a second. We mentioned O means OSPF. Now if you see an O and it's just by itself, that means it's an intra-area route. In other words, this is a route that we learned from a router in the same area. This particular route is also in area zero. You'll notice though the 192.168.3.1, not only does that have O in front of it, but it also has IA. And this stands for inter-area. In other words, this route, although we've learned, for, learned about it, it actually lives in an area different than the one this interface is configured in. So it could, we, we don't know exactly what area it's in based on the route table, but just the fact that it tells us that it's IA, inter-area, we know immediately it's in a different area than what this interface is in. Okay? Now if we want to just look at the OSPF routes, show IP route, let's add the OSPF parameter after that. And here you can see we strip out all the connected subnet information and we just look at the OSPF routes. Now there's one more command you should get familiar with and that is the show IP OSPF interface command. You can specify which interface if you like. And we learn a lot of information about this one interface. Here you can see we have the OSPF process ID, and then after that we have the router ID. And then do you remember in the tutorials we talked about the different network types? Well here we learn what network type is defined on this interface. And here it's a point to point. And then also we learn the cost, the OSPF cost of this interface. And here it's 65. Also, if we go down a little bit, you can see the configured hello interval, which is 10, and the configured dead interval, which is 40. All right, so there's a lot of information you can get from this command. And also, if we go down to, just down to the bottom here, it'll actually tell us how many neighbors we have on this interface. It's pretty convenient. So here we can see we have one neighbor, and it tells us the neighbor ID, very helpful. 
Um, and so this could be used in troubleshooting or in just helping you to identify uh, the network. Okay? Okay, so let's summarize what we covered. We have a few configuration commands that are required in order to get OSPF up and running. The first one is to enable it on the router and just remember you need to choose a unique process ID and that means you can run multiple instances if you want. Next we have to tell the router which interfaces are going to participate in OSPF. And we talked about some of the options we have there with the IP address and your wildcard mask. And then finally you state which area that interface will be in. Now in terms of verification, there's actually more commands than there are in order to configure OSPF in the first place. We can see if OSPF is running or not just by issuing the show IP OSPF command. We can take a look at all of the neighbors we have formed with the neighbor parameter. It's also a good practice to check out your route table to see if you're learning routes from OSPF neighbors. And if your route table is really big, you can organize it and just look at the routes that are from the OSPF process. And then finally, we can take a look at OSPF information that is specific to one particular interface. Okay, so these are the required configuration commands in order to get OSPF up and running, along with some verification commands. In the other tutorials, we will focus on the numerous optional OSPF configuration commands. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching.